Well, hey, everyone. Welcome to our Together for Life Utah webinar today. My name is Katie Dively, and I'm a research scientist at the Center for Health and Safety Culture. And in that role as research scientist, I provide training um, and also guidance to groups that are looking to improve health and safety. Uh, my background is public health and health promotion, and I've been working with the Center for Health and Safety Culture for just over 10 years now. So I'll be presenting today uh, along with my colleague, Jay Otto. And Jay, why don't you introduce yourself? Thanks, Katie. So my name is Jay Otto. I'm also a researcher with the Center for Health and Safety Culture. I've been with the center for a little over 10 years as well. And my background is engineering. And I'll be presenting a little bit in the second half of the webinar, going over some of the survey results and some of the findings uh, from parts of the evaluation. Cool. Thanks, Jay. So I'm happy that you're all here with us today. So we are going to be discussing the Together for Life Utah project, which aims to reduce the disparities between urban and rural seatbelt use uh, rates across Utah. And as Jay mentioned, I'll be starting and then I'll be handing it over to him a little bit later. Before we get started, though, I do want to sort of reacquaint ourselves with WebEx just to be sure that we're all on the same page and that we have it functioning properly. Um, we are recording the webinar today, so um, we will um, have you all unmute. And then when we do have that recording available, we'll post that on our Center for Health and Safety Culture website and then also our YouTube channel. Um, and then just a plug for our YouTube channel, we do have all of our previous webinars posted there. So if there's ever um, something that you want to listen to that we've done in the past, please feel free to go there and um, see those as well as other videos that we've created. If you happen to lose your audio connection, you can um, click on the little telephone icon on the bottom of your screen and it should pop up a connection or actually a couple of different connection options for you. Um, so please do that if you do lose that audio connection. If you happen to have questions during the webinar, please go ahead and ask them in the Q&A box. And if you don't mind um, addressing those um, or even in the chat window too, um, but addressing those to the entire group so that my colleagues can, uh, and I can all see those questions and respond to them. We are going to have a test sometime at the end of the webinar to, um, to be able to ask some questions. So we may um, wait until then to, to respond to some of those that you've put in the chat box. Um, otherwise, uh, we can try to weave them throughout as well. So I want to start by telling you a little bit about the Center for Health and Safety Culture. So we are located at the Western Transportation Institute at Montana State University, and the university is in Bozeman, Montana. So my colleagues and I at the center are research scientists, and we conduct research on how culture impacts health and safety. All of the research that we do is applied, and we do that in partner is applied, excuse me, and we do that in partnership with different organizations or communities and states that are all looking to improve health and safety in some way. Um, as I mentioned, all of our research is applied, but it's also sponsored by organizations that are really looking to understand how culture is impacting health and safety. And, and I think today's webinar is a good example of that. You know, we were sponsored by the Utah Department of Public Safety Highway Safety Office, and they were really interested in better understanding um, you know, ways to improve uh, seatbelt use rates across the state. So the work that we do at the center primarily covers um, these different topic areas. So traffic safety, the misuse of substances, violence, and child well-being. And together, these issues have a huge impact on public health. Um, they're the, the leading years of potential life lost and and you might also recognize that they overlap quite a bit. We know that the misuse of substances has profound impact on, tra on traffic safety and driving under the influence of substances. We also know that violence and child maltreatment are impacted by substances. You know, all of these issues are really interconnected and our team, you know, works on all of these issues and it's really interesting for us and it's really helpful as well. You know, our goal is to really take a step back and to take a look and find an approach that transcends any given issue. 
today we are going to start off by looking, um, I'll go through a bit of a background on the project and a little bit about what that project looked like, um, some of those foundational pieces. And then I'll hand it over to Jay, and Jay's going to discuss the evaluation results and the outcomes associated with the Together for Life efforts. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, we will conclude with an opportunity for questions. So a bit about why the project was started, and, and this is really about the concern um, that was being seen. So observational studies back in 2011 reflected that there were disparities between some rural areas and urban, air, and urban areas, specifically counties um, in Utah. The rural counties were using seatbelt, were using, excuse me, seatbelts at lower rates than the more urban areas. And this is a pattern that we see across the United States. Motor vehicle crashes were occurring about every nine minutes in Utah. And in about the past 10 years, 30% um, of the crash deaths in Utah involved unrestrained occupants. And, and what we know is that the crash occupants were actually 40 times more likely to be killed in those crashes than those that were restrained. So the Utah Department of Public Safety, the Highway Safety Office, really wanted to do something about this to address, to better understand this issue and, and really to address it. And so they funded a five-year project um, really to overall increase uh, seatbelt use rates across the state. So this is a simplified version of a behavior model that we use at the Center for Health and Safety Culture, uh, excuse me, Center for Health and Safety Culture, that helps us understand and predict behavior. So ultimately, our work is to improve health and safety in communities, and that's about growing more you know, positive, protective, healthy behaviors. When we look at this model of behavior change, we see, if you look at, at the far right, um, we see that if, if someone is willing or has the intention of engaging in a behavior, they're more likely to do so. And it's their attitudes and beliefs about that behavior that drive whether or not they might be willing or have the intention to engage in that behavior. And there are a variety of different beliefs um, that we might look at here. And I'm not going to go into detail on any of them, but we have behavioral beliefs and normative beliefs and control beliefs. And again, this is a simplified version of a larger, more complex model. But, um, but it really helps us understand what's driving people's behavior, such as seatbelt use. So our beliefs and our attitudes about certain behaviors are really coming from our value system. And now our values aren't specific to a behavior. They're actually more broad in nature, and they can really take some time to change. But again, it's our values that are sort of providing this foundation from which we develop certain beliefs and attitudes about a behavior that make us more willing or likely to engage in that behavior. And again, for this particular project that we're talking about today, we focused on seatbelt use. And it's actually a variety of behaviors related to seatbelts. It's not only just wearing a seatbelt, but it's also asking others to wear a seatbelt. We might have had, you know, also had organizations looking at implementing a seatbelt policy um, among their employees. So it was a variety of behaviors relating to seatbelts. This is a more complex model of the simplified version of that behavior model, just to give you um, an idea of some of the depth of it. And this is the model that we use to um, uh, develop surveys and um, more research. So again, back to this simplified version for a minute, I want to come back to the base of this model here. You might be asking, OK, well, where do we develop these values, attitudes, and beliefs from? And, and we see in the research that these come from our culture or the, the shared values and beliefs of a group of people that influence their behaviors. And for this project, we really were looking to grow a positive traffic safety culture or the shared values or beliefs of a group of people that influence their traffic safety related behaviors. And one of the key words here um, being shared, and it's that most people in this group share these values and beliefs. So basically, if we could grow shared positive values and beliefs around seatbelt use, we could increase those rates in the rural areas of Utah. This is the positive culture framework, and it's the framework that we use at the center to organize our efforts to improve health and safety. Um, you know, it's it's a framework that can be used to address a wide variety of topics. And of course, in this case, for this particular project, um, we use it to grow seatbelt use. 
I'm not going to be going into specifics on the framework, but do know um, that you can visit our website and learn more about the framework. Um, you can also visit that YouTube channel that I mentioned earlier uh, to watch a short video or one of our pre-recorded webinars on the framework. Um, there are a couple of things, however, that I do want to point out. And the first is um, on the right-hand side of that screen, you'll see that upward pointing green arrow. You know, we take a, a positive or an appreciative frame to our work. We seek to find out what is working, what are those positive beliefs and behaviors that we want to grow. On the left-hand side of the screen, you're going to see... Uh, a circle of seven steps that's in blue. And this is the process that we use to grow these protective beliefs and behaviors. Outside of that circle, you're going to see three key skills that we work to grow because they help us be more effective. And, and that's leadership, communication, and the integration of effective strategies. And then finally, in the middle of um, that circle, you're going to see a uh, purple set of sort of nested circles. And this is the social ecological model. And I'm, I'm highlighting this here a bit because you're gonna see it referenced on upcoming slides. The social ecology is a model that helps us identify the different social, this, basically the social layers of influence or so, social influences around individuals. We are all influenced by these different layers around us, so we're influenced by our families and our peers and by the organizations that we belong to or that we work for, or if we're a young person, the, the schools that we attend. And also by our community, so our community's norms and, and policies and laws. So in prevention, if we're looking to grow protected, um, protective behaviors among individuals, we really have to be looking at also growing protective beliefs and behaviors across the social ecology so that we can sustain our efforts long term. And, and we consider this, this working across the social ecology, we consider that taking a cultural approach. So let's get started um, talking about how these seven steps, the seven step process was applied to the, the project in Utah. So the first step is um, planning and advocacy. And, and this is where we really looked at the various characteristics of each county in Utah um, that we were looking at and observed seatbelt rates to, to better plan our efforts. Uh, the Utah Department of Public Safety then helped us connect with different public health coordinators in the, the different counties that we were working in. And um, let me specify, the project started with three counties, three rural counties that were identified. So we started there. And then um, about four years later, a second cohort was added, which included four more counties. So altogether here, we're talking about seven counties that we worked with that you can see on the screen. So the Department of Public Safety helped us, helped us identify um, public health coordinators in each of these counties, and they were employed at different health departments, and they had health education roles. So this um, project, this Together for Life project, really became a portion of their work. So we began to help um, build the capacity of the coordinators and the state and the state leaders on this project. And that was through training and then also guide support where we were working with them individually to help support their um, knowledge about the project and about the framework and so forth. So then the coordinators then started to work to grow or strengthen local coalitions to engage in the work you know, with the goal that if we grew the supportive group of stakeholders at the local level, that the work could eventually be sustained long term. And those, I, those leaders were identified across the social ecology. In step two, um, this is where we really sought to assess the current culture. And again, that's those shared values, attitudes, and beliefs related to seatbelt use. And we did this across the social ecology, as you can see. All of these seven steps were applied across the social ecology. So to get started, we collected data among um, adults across across these counties. And this was a random um, mailed survey to adults. We also uh, collected data among schools, and this was among students, um, and this was the addition of five of five questions to a survey, the SHARP survey that's um, um, administered to students across the state. There was also a survey, an online survey of workplace leaders, and also an online survey of um, of key leaders ac across the state. And these leaders and um, organizational leaders and key leaders were identified by the local um, health educators at the at the local health departments. 
And there was also a law enforcement survey. And this was, again, an online survey of all sworn officers uh, available to all sworn officers in those seven counties. In step three, it's, you know, when we start to identify a common purpose and prioritize our efforts. So we're making meaning of the results from all of those surveys that were implemented across uh, the state. And adults in Utah were very clear that they wanted the people that they cared about to always be wearing a seatbelt. And that was regardless of their decision to wear a seatbelt. And that's really where the brand Together for Life came from. You know, people wanted their loved ones to be safe. And this brand then, you know, identified all of the different components of the project. And so again, you know, as you can see with the social ecology here, it was more than just getting individuals to wear their seatbelts. We're really looking to grow protection across the social ecology. You know, we had to involve these different influential layers to really have a, a cultural sustained approach. And it was growing protection at each of these levels. So what did that look like? Well, for individuals, of course, we wanted people to be wearing their seatbelt, but we also wanted them to be asking others to be wearing their seatbelt. We wanted families to have rules about seatbelts, right? Um, we know that being such an important protective factor. We wanted schools, um, you know, to be promoting, you know, education around the safety around wearing seatbelts, but also promoting bystander engagement. We wanted workplaces to be having seatbelt policies and training um, and reinforcing those messages about seatbelts. And we wanted key leaders to be advocating for public policy and engagement. And of course, law enforcement officers to always be wearing their seatbelts themselves, but to consistently enforce the primary seatbelt law, which did um, come into play during this um, project, but also to be advocating for seatbelt um, for seatbelt use. Step four is all about developing a portfolio of strategies. And, you know, we know in prevention that there's no single strategy, right? There's no silver bullet that's going to effectively increase seatbelt use among everyone, right? So that means that we're going to need to invest in a variety of different strategies across the social ecology so that we can be effective. And, and that's where the tool development came in. So, so the Center for Health and Safety Culture, my organization, we developed tools for each of the counties to help guide their conversations about seatbelt use and encourage engagement from these different audiences. And the tools were really designed to confront the seriousness of not wearing a seatbelt, but also to build hope that communities could work together and reduce this risk and create positive change together. So really a, a lot of different tools to help guide these conversations. And we developed toolkits across the social ecology that came together in what we would call a large toolbox. You know, to start, there was a, a project overview toolkit, which really laid out the background for the coordinator, but also gave um, some specifics that included all of the branding and the logos, of course, for Together for Life. You know, next was the community building toolkit and the adult toolkit, and I'll talk about those a little bit more in depth. But we also had one for key leaders and for workplaces and one for law enforcement one for school leaders and also for students, and then a social media toolkit to help them engage with others um, through their local social media platforms. And so this, of course, was through local public health agencies, but also through their coalition networks as well. So let's talk for a minute about that community building toolkit. So this this came first, and this was really an effort to help those coordinators at the seven different, um, in the seven different counties, cultivate and share the community's values that were discovered through the assessments that we found. So it helped establish a connection within the community and also promote awareness that this was a concern that needed to be addressed, but also that there was hope that working together they could create positive change on the issue of seatbelts. And in this toolkit, there was, um, as there always is, a toolkit for the coordinator, which included all of the background information, and then also media for the community. And that included, in, in this case, uh, four different posters, two radio ads, and also two videos. And this community building media really set the tone for the rest of the toolkits that were to come. In the adult toolkit, um, you know, each toolkit has its own goals because we want to grow specific actions at each level of the social ecology. So for the adult toolkit, the main goals were to promote, of course, the importance of always wearing your seatbelt, but also engaging others to wear their seatbelt. And then again, also to establish those family rules about wearing a seatbelt, knowing how important that was. 
So in this specific toolkit, there was, um, as always, a toolkit for the county coordinator. And again, this had the background information about that specific audience and why reaching that audience was so critical. Um, it had data reports from the community adult survey. It also had um, an activity decision-making worksheet. And now this is an, a worksheet that a coordinator can engage in with uh, their local coalition. So if they're deciding whether or not to engage in a particular activity, they can kind of go through this process that helps them filter that activity through the project goals to determine if it's worth their investment. So just a tool to help them make decisions about what they do want to do. Um, it provided speaking points uh, related to the adults in their county. It provided a press release that they were encouraged to distribute, sort of announcing the, um, the adult tools that were available. It had county-specific print media. So in the form of posters, there were three posters. Um, there were county-specific videos as well, um, and three of them. And again, this media was all reflecting the shared positive values and beliefs that were held among the adults. And this was, again, in an effort to change um, and to grow more seatbelt use and engagement in encouraging others to wear their seatbelt. And I'm not going to go through all of the different toolkits, but um, I did want to share just a couple of the details um, of, of two of them with you. So this project was was really focused on creating some conversations related to seatbelt use across these seven rural counties. And because of that, we developed a pretty comprehensive communication plan. And, and that, uh, you know, met com communications, you know, among the practitioners at the county level, but also with the public too. So with the practitioners, with those county level coordinators, we did develop a private community of practice site. And that site allowed the county level coordinators to increase their capacity on the project, but also the positive of culture framework that was used. It also served as a place that they could house or that we housed all of their toolkits. So all of the media, all of the tools that they had access to were available for them to print and, you know, download and, and watch and all of that. They were also um, invited to extend access of, to that private community of practice site with their coalition members to sort of increase the reach there was also a public website that was developed for the project, and that's togetherforlifeutah.org. And that's, again, looking to, you know, to drive people towards that site who are looking for more information. Perhaps they saw a billboard or they saw or heard a radio ad. They knew where to go for more information. And so some of the media was placed there, but also uh, local contact information for the coordinators throughout the state so they could find somebody local to see what local efforts looked like. A lot of media was developed as part of this project, as you can already see. Um, that included some some shorter, you know, 30-second uh, video spots, some 60-second videos. There were radio spots um, that were developed. There are newspaper ads, posters, um, you know, booklets for particular audiences, and also banners that were created. And then, of course, social media posts, posts that could be used on a variety of different platforms. So they could just cut and paste in and, you know, put media out there. And then there was also placed media for the project, and that was really to motivate the conversations throughout the state. And, and that included radio ads, Pandora ads, local mo movie theater ads, and also uh, local newspaper ads. And, and that was all done in conjunction with the local coordinator. So they told us, you know, what those main communication channels were at in their counties, and um, we looked to place media at, at those sites. So that's the first kind of four steps of the positive culture frameworks or how we um, apply the framework to this project. And now I'm going to turn it over to Jay. And Jay's going to walk through uh, the remaining steps um, of the process and then also um, some of those evaluation findings. Great. Jay, thanks. over to you. Sure. Yep, thanks, Katie. So on the next slide, uh, the, the fifth and sixth steps, the fifth step is really around piloting. So we did pilot tests of um, all of the media ahead of time to sort of get feedback and reaction from folks, make adjustments around language based on that. We also sort of viewed the entire project as a pilot. We were just working within uh, seven counties. There are more rural counties than that in Utah. So from a bigger perspective, sort of a large scale, the project was a pilot as well. Um, then when we moved into step six, which is really start bringing all of this information out in uh, through the, the county coordinators, this is where we also engaged in guide service. And Katie mentioned this before. 
So we've learned over the years of doing projects that it's important not only to create resources and tools and toolkits, but also to provide guidance for individuals locally as they use those tools. Um, every community is a little different. Every um, situation has its own uh, unique characteristics. And so a guide doesn't come in with answers necessarily, but may come in with ideas that have been learned from other projects that we've been engaged on. And so the guide engaged in monthly calls with each of the coordinators one-on-one -on -one to sort of talk about what, what was happening in that community, how they could uh, brainstorm and overcome some challenges if they came up, work on goal setting and reporting and different things like that. So we've learned that's a critical part of uh, project work as well, sort of that, that last component and, and helping that uh, capacity building at the local level. Uh, when we look at cultural-based projects, we're always uh, uh, really thinking about these as, as locally as we can, um, and, and that really helps to leverage the local aspects of that culture. So if you want to go to the next slide, so um, we were able to set it up to, to have some um, pretty good evaluation. What we wanted to do was uh, we conducted baseline surveys. So those assessed people's uh, beliefs and self-reported behaviors. And then we were able to compare, we were able to repeat those and compare them um, from baseline to 2019. And 2019 was really a couple of years after the media and the projects had got, uh, or the, the toolkits had come out. It took us a while to develop those toolkits. Um, we also were very fortunate in that Utah DPS coordinated to have their observed seatbelt use. Um, coordinate with these seven counties. So we were able to have baseline observed seatbelt use and then follow-up observation studies. So that, that was very helpful as well. And then we also looked at um, some of the consequence data. So we were able to, to pull their records, their crash report data in terms of unrestrained serious injuries and fatality crashes. And of course, that's the ultimate goal. We're seeking to change behaviors about seatbelts, uh, broadly across the social ecology, ultimately to get people to wear more seatbelts and ultimately to reduce unrestrained serious injury and fatality. So we wanted to look at that as well. So what I'm going to do is walk through these different pieces and just share some of the things that we learned. So we always begin uh, when we're able to, especially when a, when a project involves a media component, we do like to look at campaign awareness, just sort of were people even hearing the messages? And what we found was about half of the population in these communities reported that they had heard the messaging. Um, that's pretty good, that's not great. We would typically like that upwards in the 80%, but um, for a relatively short time. Also, um, in rural communities, we had some restrictions in terms of the kinds of media we could use. We weren't doing any television. We did do some local radio where they had local radio stations. Some of the communities did not. And then we were also using uh, targeted media through uh, uh, web channels, so Pandora and other things like that. The data that I'm also going to share, I am going to split out by gender. Um, like many traffic safety behaviors, seatbelt usage is one that does seem to vary by gender. Males wear seatbelts less frequently than females do. So it's interesting just to separate those uh, um, out and so you can get a little bit uh, finer understanding of, of some of the changes. So on the next slide, um, what we looked at was, no, yeah, there you go. Um, we wanted to look at, we used the, the random sample of households to understand people's behaviors, their self-reported behaviors about wearing a seatbelt and some of their beliefs about wearing a seatbelt. We also used that survey to assess their beliefs and behaviors about asking others to wear a seatbelt. That was a key thing that we wanted to focus on. We also wanted to check in on um, family seatbelt rules and we also wanted to see um, their self-report about their workplaces. So from their perspective, were their workplaces, did they have a seatbelt policy and training and different things about that? So those are some of the first things we'll look at. Okay, if you want to go to the next slide. So these are some adult behaviors. These are across all seven counties. 
um, from the random household survey. So this is self-report. This is not observational. And one of the things we wanted to look at is the percentage of people who were always wearing a seatbelt when driving a few miles from home, when driving many miles from home, and just in general. And you can see overall seatbelt usage is lower when people are driving a few miles as opposed to when they're driving many miles. That's a pattern we've seen on lots of our seatbelt uh, seat studies and we want to improve that. Um, what we did find is that um, male in, we saw increases statistically significant and small effect sizes. Uh, improvement among males. Females were already higher than the males and stayed about the same. We also saw, we saw those changes both in terms of driving a few miles from home, many miles from home in general. So that was good. That was some of what we were intending to do. Um, now, these were changes that we saw amongst people who reported they had awareness of the campaign. When we looked at people who did not have awareness of the campaign, we did not see any statistically significant changes in that group. Um, so this is amongst the people who had awareness of the campaign. So it limits it in terms of the campaign didn't reach everyone, um, but that was also part of our study was to see, or to see did, the, did the campaign, how is that potentially impacting them? Um, if you wanna go to the next slide, okay. So we also wanted to look at their beliefs. Uh, as Katie indicated, our, our sort of logic behind changing behavior is that we want to shift beliefs and that it's through that shift in beliefs that we often see changes in behaviors. So one of the core beliefs that we learned was associated with seatbelt uh, use was that it's important to protect myself by always wearing a seatbelt. And we were able to see increases in that amongst males. It was already higher among females and tended to and stayed about the same. Strongly agree that they should always wear a seatbelt. That's sort of that intention to wear it. Um, that increased among males as well. And this one that they wanted people they care about to always wear a seatbelt. And that grew as well. And that, that, as Katie mentioned, we had seen earlier on, even people who weren't wearing a seatbelt wanted people they cared about to wear a seatbelt. So they sort of understood what seatbelts did. They, they valued it in the sense that they valued protection for their loved ones, but there was something not about them using it. But we wanted to focus on that because a lot of the focus was also on asking others to wear a seatbelt. So the next slide, um, these were additional beliefs so strongly agree that people who care about them want them to always wear a seatbelt. That's actually what we would call the perceived injunctive norm, the expectation that I have that people who are important to me want me to engage in a behavior or not engage in a behavior. And we were able to see this increase among males. So that was good. We want to drive that up. The more I feel like I'm expected to do something, I typically do it. We also looked at their perception of what other people were doing. This is uh, the perceived descriptive norm. The two kinds of perceived norms, injunctive and descriptive. So the second one is the perceived descriptive norm. And we were seeking to drive that up through the media too. It's interesting to note that their perception that most people always or almost always wear a seatbelt is still very low. Most people in these counties were wearing their seatbelts, but that's still a significant misperception. But we were able to move it in the right direction, and there's still a lot of room to grow there. So there's more work we can do there. We also just wanted to look at some um, uh, basic uh, beliefs around control. Their control beliefs don't have a huge impact on seatbelt use. Seatbelt use is not a terribly complex behavior. Um, but we wanted to look at this, was, was there any sort of social aspect that people were feeling uncomfortable to wear or comfortable to wear a seatbelt if others in the vehicle were not? And um, as you can see, we saw some increases there amongst males. Um, females were already a little bit higher on that, no real changes. We also did want to look at sort of classic deterrence, that sense of would they get a ticket if they, uh, if they um, were not wearing a seatbelt? And that went up as well. Um, but what was really interesting was that last one is not associated with seatbelt use. All these other ones strongly correlate with seatbelt use. 
But the perception as to whether they'd get a ticket or not did not correlate with whether they were actually wearing a seatbelt, which is just um, very interesting. So on the next slide, um, we also asked about home and workplace rules. So did they report that their home had a rule? And we saw that increase among males. Females were already reporting that was higher uh, to begin with. And we wanted to look at the perception. Did they think most families in their county had a family rule? Because we also had that sense that if we could drive the perception up that family rules were typical, that might increase um, a little bit of pressure to, to, for families to adopt family rules as well. And we saw that increase with males and it, it really didn't change with uh, females. We also looked at workplace rules. Uh, workplace rules really didn't change. Um, you can also see that the prevalence of workplace rules is a little bit lower than family rules. Um, and that's a real opportunity. We feel we still want to do some more work on that. Um, we know that we can influence adult behaviors both through their family layer of the social ecology, but also through the workplace layer. Workplaces can have a significant impact on adult behaviors. So while we did some work on that, uh, we want to continue to do more work on that. And though we did, we did see a shift in the perception that most workplaces would have rules. So that was good to see. Um, we want to continue to, to drive that up. And of course, the decision about having a rule and enforcing a rule is, is often in a workplace, maybe held by a very small number of people in a leadership role. And this survey was amongst all the general population. So, um, but our work will continue to work with those leaders to grow uh, workplace rules as well. So that was a little bit about what we learned from the adults. We also wanted to focus on the adults uh, in terms of their intervening behaviors. So this was key. Not only are you wearing a seatbelt, but are you asking others to wear a seatbelt? And we looked at that in two contexts. We looked at it in the context of being a driver, where we might have a greater sense of authority over the vehicle, sort of I'm, I'm the pilot of the vehicle, as well as a passenger. And we did see increases amongst males of making sure everyone was wearing a seatbelt. Again, you can see females were already at a significantly higher level of that than the males, and we didn't really see a lot of change there. Um, we also saw an increase as they were passengers, but you can also see in general, the prevalence among passengers is just much lower than drivers. So that'll be interesting in our future as we continue work on this, to how do we, how do we empower passengers, that it's not just the drivers who can speak up, but passengers can speak up as well. We did see an increase in the sense of their responsibility, which is kind of a form of an injunctive norm, a perceived injunctive norm that they should ask others to wear their seatbelt and it's their responsibility as a driver to do it. And we saw some increases in their responsibility as a passenger. But again, you can see overall their sense of responsibility as a passenger is just much lower than as a driver. So we wanna, we wanna uh, focus on that as well. So those are some good opportunities for the future. But these are all things that we focused on in the toolkits and the media. Here we also looked at um, some associated beliefs with intervening. One of the things that uh, we know from research around intervening is I'm more likely to intervene if I feel like intervening is acceptable sort of in my culture, if it's, it's something that others do. So we wanted to look at that sense, do they believe that most drivers in their county would make sure others were wearing a seatbelt? Um, and we saw increases there, so that was good. We wanted, to, we wanted to very much normalize intervening because if we can normalize it, that get, sort of gives people permission to do it. And you could see um, we could increase that as well amongst passengers, but their overall perception of the prevalence of these behaviors is relatively low. So we have opportunity to grow those, but we wanted to sort of make this a, a normal, typical behavior. Um, we also have learned that intervening depends on whether they feel comfortable doing it. They might feel like they should do it, they're responsible. They might feel like uh, most people do it, but they still might be uncomfortable doing it. And that can really dominate whether they do it or not. And so we focused on trying to make it comfortable just by in some of the media showing examples of what it could look like and making it no big deal. Um, and we were able to see some increases there amongst males that they were more comfortable in doing it, so that was good. The females are already a little bit higher on that. 
and wasn't really a statistically significant change. We also were able to increase their comfort and ability to, uh, as a passenger. So these were all things that we had focused on through the media, and we were able to see some statistically significant and, and meaningfully of meaningful effect size uh, changes in such a small period of time and relatively low dosage of the media. So that was very encouraging. On the next slide, um, we also looked at thing, uh, behaviors and beliefs among students. So as, as Katie mentioned, we were able to add a few questions to the existing um, surveys that they do among students around health uh, behaviors. It's called the SHARP survey. And we added, I think, about five questions. They had two, they had one question already on there about seatbelt use, and we were able to add five more to understand some of the beliefs among students about seatbelts. And we not only wanted them to wear a seatbelt, but we also wanted to encourage them to talk to their friends about wearing a seatbelt. So on the next slide, we have some of those results. These are just looking amongst the high school students. Um, we also have some data from the middle school students, but we really want to focus on the high school students where they're starting to, to drive some more themselves. Um, we were able to see some increases against, among, again, amongst the males in terms of always wearing a seatbelt when they were riding in a car and their perception and some of their we didn't really see much changes in terms of their beliefs about other students always wearing a seatbelt. And you can see those are just super low. So the majority of students are wearing seatbelts, but they really don't think their peers are. So we have a lot of opportunity to grow those. Um, and this notion that they wanted the people that they care about to always wear a seatbelt. We wanted to grow that because we also knew that um, youth, high, high school students, care a lot about their friends. And if we could, if we could grow that sense of, yeah, I, I want the people I care about to wear a seatbelt, that might also empower them to speak up. So we wanted to drive that up as well. And we could see some changes there. Then we looked at their intervening behavior, sort of, do they agree they should ask a friend to wear a seatbelt? And we were able to see some increases there. That was good. Do they believe most students in their school would agree they should ask a friend? No real changes there. So uh, no significant changes on their perceptions of some of the norms. Were they very likely to ask a friend? That increased some amongst males. was pretty uh, no change amongst females. You can already see the females were a little bit higher than the males at, at baseline. So it's good where we're to see that likelihood. And believing most students in their school would be very likely to ask a friend, sort of that perception of what others were doing. Changed a little bit with males, but not, not a whole lot. And so um, we were encouraged by that, but we also recognized that I think there's a lot more we could do amongst youth. The youth were also hearing some of the media that the, the adults were hearing clearly, so they were getting some impact from that. But I think there's some additional things we could do in the high school settings to, to bolster these beliefs as well. I want to go to the next slide. Now, we also did uh, surveys of law enforcement officers. So this was done in all of the agencies in the county, whether they were a sheriff's office, a municipal police department, or uh, a highway patrol office. And um, we, we reached out to all the different agencies. All the different agencies participated, but participation levels in 2019, the follow-up, were much lower than what we had at baseline. We, we were a little concerned on that. This is an area we want to do some more work on. So if you want to go to the next slide. We were focusing principally on, on two big behaviors. We wanted to look at were they wearing their seatbelts and were they consistently enforcing seatbelt laws. And we were, we were discouraged here. Um, we really saw no changes in behaviors or beliefs. Um, at baseline, we had been pretty concerned about seatbelt use by officers. They were wearing their seatbelts at lower rates than the counties that they were serving. We had about a quarter of the officers report not wearing a seatbelt while on duty in the past week or, or you know, at least in the past week, which was, which was very concerning. We did see about six out of 10 reporting always wearing a seatbelt while on duty or off duty, but that meant about four out of 10 were not, which was just way too high. And even though overwhelmingly they reported that their agency had a policy about always wearing a seatbelt. So this is definitely an area we're gonna do a lot more focus on in the coming cohort. 
Um, we're going to engage a lot more with uh, regional law enforcement liaison officers as well as the state li uh, law enforcement liaison officers to really see how we can move the needle here. This was discouraging. We had created a, a pretty cool book booklet for law enforcement agencies that was based on their survey. It was positively framed, but we didn't feel like we got a lot of traction with that. So this is something we're going to really dive into deeply and, and want to see some, some changes on. So we can go to the next slide. So the other group that we looked at were key leaders. Um, and we looked at them in terms of advocating for policies and just engagement in the work in general. This was not a random sample. This was a snowball survey where we, the, the coordinators and the coalition just identified as many different leaders as they could in their community. They could be formal or informal leaders, you know, elected officials or just people they considered leaders. And then we asked those people to take the survey as well as forward it on to other leaders. And so um, it's not at all, it's, it, it's, it, it's not representative and it's, um, you know, varies from baseline to follow up. It wasn't necessarily the exact same people. The leadership could have changed, but it gave us a sense as to what some of the leaders and business leaders were thinking about and engaging with. Um, we didn't really see any changes in terms of did they have a workplace rule about wearing a seatbelt? And we see these numbers as an opportunity. I mean, there's no reason we can't push those up much closer to 100%. Um, no real perception, changes in their perception of whether most uh, places in their workplaces in their county had a workplace, had a, had a policy. Um, we did see a slight increase in their perception that workplace was enforcing the policy. And there's an agreement that they should require employees to wear seatbelts. So those are positive beliefs that we can build on, but we still have some room to improve and grow there. And again, we know that workplaces are a key opportunity to reach adults. And so we're going to do some really focused work on that in the, in the coming years as well. So that really was uh, not all of the data that we collected through the surveys, but some of the highlights that we collected from the surveys. Now, this slide is overviewing observed seatbelt use. Um, the, the black dashed line is a, is a um, combination of a few urban counties. So you do have like Salt Lake City in Utah, which is very much an urban city, a very large urban city, and Provo and some other areas. So we aggregated a few of those urban counties and looked at their observed seatbelt use. And then the other seven are the seven counties where we were working on. And as Katie mentioned at the beginning, the goal of the project was to reduce disparities. And you can see pretty significant disparities at the beginning. And as we were able to move through, really able to reduce those disparities. Not a huge change in seatbelt usage among the urban counties. That was kind of flat, maybe a slight increase. But we were able to see some good changes in observed seatbelt use amongst the, um, the rural counties. And in some cases, they had even started to exceed what was going on in the urban. So we were very excited about that. And continue to grow. I mean, obviously, the goal is 100%. Um, but, but we were encouraged to see some growth and change over the time period. We also looked at unrestrained serious injuries. Now, this gets, this gets a little tricky to interpret. Um, we're looking at much smaller numbers here. When we look at unrestrained serious injury crashes, those crashes have, have a higher number amongst um, the urban counties because they just have much you know, larger populations, so they have larger numbers. So you can see that graph is kind of stable. It is significantly lower than in rural communities, and, and often that has to do with speed, um, right? In, in urban areas, we have lower speeds, so crashes may not be resulting in as many um, serious injuries, as well as seatbelt usage. Um, but um, it's hard to make a lot of interpretation out of the pattern here in the rural communities um, simply because the number of unrestrained serious injury crashes is relatively no, low, so it's susceptible to you know, significant variety or jumps from year to year. So we'll just have to continue to monitor this and see what the trend looks like and sort of aggregate over multiple years. We also did look on the next slide at unrestrained fatals. Um, you can see that's got uh, some variation in the urban counties as well. Again, the number of unrestrained fatalities is even lower, thank goodness, than the unrestrained serious injuries. So these numbers do tend to bounce around quite a bit 
Um, we wanted to examine them, but we're not drawing a lot of conclusions about them yet because it's definitely going to take some time to aggregate um, enough data over years to really see any kind of patterns. So on the next slide, just to summarize, we did see both self-reported and observed seatbelt use increase in the seven counties. Um, we also saw beliefs correlated with seatbelt use change as well. These are the beliefs that we were focusing on. Um, we saw some behaviors and beliefs change among students and key leaders, and really no changes in behaviors or beliefs among law enforcement officers. Now, we do want to really just put out a caution. We don't have a control group, um, so that really limits our ability to claim that our activities, these activities, cause these changes. They kind of align because of the, the kinds of beliefs we were focusing on in the media um, was reflected in some of the changes. Also, the, the, that we didn't see changes amongst as much, you know, we didn't really see changes amongst those who weren't aware of the media. But still, scientifically, we're limited by that. We don't have a comparison group. And so we can't, we can't make those claims. Um, it, it, it logically aligns, but we, we don't have the scientific grounding to say that it was causal. So on the next slide, um, some of our next steps, we're going to be continuing to work with these seven counties. We've got some great uh, leaders in those counties. The, the public health folks who are working with us learned a lot. Um, they're doing some super work, so we're excited to continue to work with them. As you could see, we identified several opportunities where we can do better, so we're going to try to make some more tools and refine tools to help them uh, address those areas. We've also added two new rural counties, and we're beginning with them. Uh, they're, some of them are, one of them is really starting at the beginning, so they'll, they'll be growing their own coalition. We'll be starting some survey work with them very soon to get the baseline surveys, develop their toolkits, and start working with them. So those are some of the next steps. So the project is definitely continuing. I'm going to go to the next slide. So we do want to pause here. Um, I'm keeping an eye on the chat window and uh, haven't really seen a lot come in. So feel free now to type in in your chat window and you can just share it with all participants. Any questions you might have. Um, a question came up sort of about the accuracy of self-report on wearing seatbelts. That's, that's always a concern. Um, with any kind of behavior when we look at self-report. So this was great because we could also look at observed studies. Um, we found that observational studies among the general population aligned pretty well with actually the, the numbers we were seeing from self-report. So that was encouraging. But you're right, from a law enforcement standpoint, there can be really limitations. Although we were kind of surprised how many law enforcement officers were saying um, they were not wearing their seatbelt. So they, they were pretty uh, blunt that they just weren't wearing their seatbelt. Um, for collecting self-report data, we did use um, random sample mailed su surveys to for community adults. So we used a four contact mailing um, out. We would randomly select the households from mailing lists. We would send them an introductory letter um, saying they'd been selected. We would send them a survey packet with a, a, a postage paid envelope. We then did a reminder postcard and another survey packet. And our participation rates were pretty good. We were in the mid-30s up into the mid-40s uh, percentage response rate, which was, which was very encouraging. Um, so that, that was the method that we used for, for uh, the general adult surveys. For the other surveys, they were all done online. So um, in the online surveys among law enforcement, we asked the law enforcement leader to send out uh, a link to the survey, and then the officers could participate in it. It had to be voluntary. And the snowball survey was also online. And then the student survey was a paper survey that was done in conjunction with a whole lot of other questions, a very long survey that the kids fill out. And they just do that every couple of years. Uh, and we just added a few questions for that. So how are you accounting for the change from secondary to primary? So that's a huge piece, right? Um, Utah, we, we were very excited when we started this project because we were like, wow, this is a really cool sort of experiment that we can set up. We can look at it over time. We can do comparisons. And the likelihood that Utah goes from a secondary law to a primary law state is just really low. Well, lo and behold, um, kind of in the middle of the project, they, or May of 2015, which was actually before the media went out, 
they did shift from a secondary or primary. And we were very happy about that. That's a good thing. Um, so we were really, really conflicted in terms of how we'd be able to, to ferret out some of those issues. And there's no question that that had an impact. However, what was interesting to see was, one, when we looked at some of the changes in um, the urban counties, we didn't see as much change there as we were seeing in the rural counties. Now, they were already at a higher level, and we know sort of getting that last 10 percent is really tricky. The other thing that we looked at was um, the relationship to campaign awareness, which would have transcended um, sort of the, the primary seatbelt law applied to everybody. But when we looked at results and belief changes amongst those who were aware of the campaign versus those who were not, we were seeing changes amongst those who were aware and we weren't seeing changes amongst those who were not. Um, we're also aware that sort of the primary law doesn't have any real focus on bystander intervention, and that was something we were focusing on as well. So there's no question that the primary law had an impact. We, we're not denying that at all. And we're very interested as we go to this next cohort to, to, to sort of be past that and see what happens now. And we were still encouraged to see some of those other changes that we saw based um, on, on intervening as well as based on campaign awareness. So in other words, did you look at enforcement efforts being conducted? So um, only aspects of enforcement efforts were really looked at by, by self-report of officers through the surveys. And um, it was a little bit tricky to tell um, because the participation rates were a little bit lower in the, the post-survey of officers in 2019 than in the pre we kind of saw a reduction in enforcement activities by by officers, but it was a, a little hard to sort of claim that strongly because the participation was down. So we we didn't call that out necessarily. It's it's there, um, but I, I think the statistical significance is kind of weak because the participation rates were a little bit lower. But we certainly didn't see an increase, and so we we really just didn't see changes amongst the officers. So that that's an area we just got to be more successful at. Did you gain any correlation between officers who did or did not wear seatbelts to issuance of tickets for seatbelt violations? Um, we can go back and look at that. As I recall, definitely sort of um, strong beliefs around seatbelt usage or so strong beliefs around the protective aspects of seatbelts was associated with seatbelt use and tended to also be associated with a little bit more enforcement there. But I'm not sure the effect size on that so it's something we can go back. That's a good question. I do believe that's sort of all tied together. And we also know from other work we've done with law enforcement surveys that um, supervisor expectations, leader expectations really dominate that. So what am I expected to do? Is it, is it a part of my duty um, by as I perceive it from my immediate supervisor and the highest officer or the, the, my superior officer in the agency has a really dominant impact on, on enforcement behaviors as well? All right, so I'm mindful of the time. If you want to go, we'll just do a couple more questions or slides here to round it out. Um, so the Together for Life is is continuing on. Quickly about some other research projects we're doing that, that's kind of exciting. We're doing a neat project looking in, in this issue of seatbelt use as to the role of psychological reactance and moral disengagement. So we know across the country and now in Utah, we're seeing more and more people wear seatbelts and we're getting down to that small group who's not. And we're kind of curious what's going on there. And are those folks just prone to psychological reactance, which means they just sort of push back against anything that threatens their um, freedoms and aspects of moral disengagement. And we're looking at in two behaviors, seatbelt use and aggressive driving. So we're actually doing some message testing now. The preliminary work we've done has shown that both of these are impacting in these two behaviors. And now we're looking at trying, testing some messages to see if we can reduce it. We're also continuing work around beliefs behind driving under the influence of cannabis. We know as more and more states um, legalize various forms of cannabis use, we're seeing an increase in driving under the influence of cannabis. And we're really trying to understand the culture of that. What are the beliefs behind it? Uh, we've done some preliminary work on that. It's very interesting. We're doing a fascinating project in Washington State looking at the role of parents in teaching safe driving behaviors. We really want to look at that 
from an early age. You know, it, when a child is very young and in the vehicle, a parent can start labeling what safe driving behavior looks like. It doesn't have to wait until the, the young person is behind the wheel, but they, that, that teaching can begin very early. So we're very excited about that. We've conducted a survey. We're now going to start analyzing it. And we're doing ongoing work on growing safety culture within DOTs that we're very excited about. So those are just some of the current other projects that we're doing. You can keep your eye out for webinars on those. And just other services that we provide, we do provide training very specifically on the framework, on social norms marketing, on leadership and integration. Guide service is critical, we find, in terms of, of executing projects well, and so we do that. We do a variety of assessments, surveys, and evaluation, and as Katie mentioned, a number of webinars that are out there. And um, just very quickly, in terms of the other, other upcoming things, um, we do have, a webinar that's coming up on June 17 about uh, three lessons to facilitate transforming health and safety culture. Traffic safety culture is certainly a part of that, and that'll be in a couple of months. And then we, we every year we do an open positive culture framework training. If you're interested in learning more about sort of the, the behind the, 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 uh, the details of the approach, we've postponed that a little bit, trying to figure out what, what face to face training is going to look like in the future. It, it, would typically be in the fall, but we just have to see in the context of the pandemic. So we thank you very much for your time. We thank you very much for the work you do. Um, absolutely, in our current context, stay safe. Um, it is a very trying time, but um, still we all need to be continually focused on traffic safety as well. Um, these are ways that you can follow us and um, keep, keep in contact. And uh, again, thank you very much for your time today and stay safe.